ASPCAI may sound like the ASPCA, but this animal charity was founded by a notorious scammer. The founder has partnered with a man who is in large part responsible for bringing porn to the internet, and he funds the lives of the SPCAI's marketing team. In today's episode, we will not only uncover a scammy charity, but the system behind it. So hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and people that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and we are going to sink our teeth into a so-called charity called the SPCAI. We've heard of scam charities plenty of times here and how these scams will often use genuine sounding names to get people to donate to them. Whether it's the Kids Wish Network sounding similar to the Make-A-Wish Foundation or the dozens of veterans charities that use the gold role model, something that I talked about in my episode on Shiloh Ministries phone scam episode, real sounding fake scams are unfortunately common. Today, we're going to talk about the SPCA International or the SPCAI. And as you could have guessed, this is some kind of bad knockoff of the ASPCA, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, a very well-known charity dedicated to animal welfare. So what exactly is the SPCAI then? Well, that's what we're gonna find out today. So let's get into it. The SPCAI is supposedly a New York-based charity the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals International. Their website appears legitimate enough and does remind me of the ASPCAs a bit. They've got that red orange color, information on the homepage about their advocacy work, as well as, of course, an adorable picture of a doggo giving the viewer puppy eyes. They mention resources about spaying and neutering, what to do if your pet dies, and advice on everything from declawing to healing anxiety in their pet advice sections but a snazzy website doesn't make a good charity. So let's take a look at their history and see where the SPCAI began, according to their history page. The first Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was organized in England in 1824, primarily to prevent the abuse of carriage horses in the days before automobiles. Horses were driven through freezing cold winters and stiffingly hot summers, often with little food, water, or rest. The carriage drivers were interested in only making as much money as possible and would beat the horses if they refused to or were unable to pull the carriages. The first SPCA helped to pass laws that regulated the carriage horse business. With this success, the society expanded to include dogs and other animals in its fight against cruelty. The first American SPCA was started in 1866 in New York City. There are now SPCAs all over the US and indeed all over the world. SPCA International was founded in the US in 2006. The mission of our organization is simple but vast, to advance the safety and well-being of animals. They also do note on this page that many local SPCAs and humane societies around the world aren't affiliated with national organizations. That's why SPCA International seeks to develop a worldwide network. They've also launched two major initiatives, the Shelter of the Week in 2007, later renamed to the Shelter Support Fund and Operation Baghdad Pups. The first gives grants to struggling shelters, and the second helps provide vet care, clearance, and transport for animals that US service members befriend or adopt during deployment. And both of these sound like worthy causes, absolutely. Their history sounds meaningful, passionate, and earnest. However, here's the thing that you've got to understand about the SPCA, international or otherwise. They briefly mention it in their history, but it is an incredibly important point. SPCAs operate independently. SPCA is a commonly used name. Go to any SPCA website, whether it be from Louisiana to Kenya to dozens of locations around the globe. They all campaign for animal welfare, but are separate organizations. Policies vary between SPCA to SPCA. The well-known one covering America, the ASPCA itself, isn't associated with them, and they're in no way connected. Royal SPCA or RSPCA is the first one that SPCAI mentions in their website. It was founded in the UK and its patron is Queen Elizabeth II herself. 
SPCAI sounds like it's another one of these SPCAs out there that's trying to expand their reach across the globe to get help when in actuality, they're nothing more than the creation of an absolute loon who simply took the old and popular name and stuck an eye at the end of it. And when you call it international and because SPCAs are so common, this sounds legitimate and they began raking in the dough. So that sounds pretty messed up, right? Well, let's talk about who this individual is and when SPCAI was really founded and why. Pierre Barnotti is a horrible person. And I realize I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, which I'll get to that in just a couple minutes. And some of you will have plenty worse to say about him than I do. The first thing that actually brought my attention to the SPCAI was a Mother Jones article, which discusses how he founded the so-called charity in detail. They write, not much is publicly known about Barnati's time before entering the animal welfare world. A former real estate agent, he emerged in 1994 at the center of a bizarre controversy involving the Montreal SPCA. At the time, the decades old animal rights organization was mired in debt. In November, 1994, it hired its fourth leader in four months, a 44 year old monk known as brother Dominique. Days into his tenure, Dominique approved a lucrative contract for Barnati's company to run the charity's fundraising campaign. The Montreal Gazette quickly uncovered two problems. First, Barnati had declared bankruptcy a month earlier with a 1971 Rolls Royce worth $2,500 as his sole asset. And more curiously, brother Dominique did not in fact appear to be a monk. The newspaper reported that no outside authority seems able to confirm brother Dominique's actual identity. Weeks after his hiring was announced, Dominique was fired. Barnati, who held a press conference to defend Dominique, insisted that their contract was valid. Barnati describes himself as an ideal salesman for the Montreal SPCA and said the charity's image needed to be smooth like Mother Teresa's. With allies on the board and deep influence within the charity, he began identifying himself in news reports as the Montreal SPCA's fundraiser and official spokesman. And by the end of 1995, executive director was added to that list of titles. It was just one thing leading to another. And there I was in charge. He reflected to the Ottawa citizen in 2000. I could have built millions of dollars worth of real estate, but what I'm doing now is much more rewarding. As it turns out though, Barnati should have stuck to real estate. In 1995, several former charity employees alleged that he was ignoring the organization's charitable mission while driving up cost. A former executive sued Barnati for defamation and in 2006, a Canadian judge ordered the Montreal SPCA to pay a Quebec marketing firm nearly $100,000 owed as part of a contract that wasn't paid. In 2007, Globe and Mail, a Canadian newspaper, revealed a scheme where Barnati marketed the Montreal SPCA as a national charity by using the name, the Canadian Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And I wanna take a moment to just say, notice the pattern here. Barnati seemed intent on making the Montreal SPCA look bigger than it actually was to gain more donors from more places. After the paper's release, Barnati was quoted as saying, If I knew that my mother had donated to a cause where people have misled her or given her false information, I would be devastated, he told the paper. On the other hand, if my mother, who's 91, donated to a good cause, but isn't sure where this cause is, as long as I knew the money went to the right place and served the right mission, I'd be perfectly happy, end quote. He's basically promoting the idea that ignorance is bliss and who cares as long as the money helps animals. And hey, as long as the money is benefiting animals, then what's the difference, right? Well, unfortunately it wasn't. Instead, it was just lining his pockets and paying for fundraising. He used SPCA funds for personal travel while engaging in improper fundraising activities, all while euthanizing an unnecessarily high number of animals, according to the New York Times. People were justifiably outraged at Barnati for what he'd done. And after all this bad press and even protests outside the Montreal SPCA, he resigned. They wound up $4 million in debt. And after an investigation by the Canada Revenue Agency, which is their IRS for the American viewers, many of their board of directors resigned. Yet Barnati was not perturbed. And why would he be? He found a golden goose in animal charities and he was not going to let go of it. All the while, as Canada found new reasons to hate him, Barnati registered a new charity, the SPCAI. And he did it all with some equally disgusting friends. 
A 2008 New York Times investigation into Barnati reads, Two years ago, a new United States organization called SPCA International took over the SPCA.com internet domain, originally Montreal's domain, and started using it to solicit money for animal rights. According to public records and a report last November in Animal People, an animal care industry newspaper, Barnati registered a company called SPCA International in May 2006 in Delaware. Registering an animal rights organization in the United States allowed Barnati to raise money here, and he hired a New York City direct mail company to solicit donations. In an effort to beef up the group's web presence, Barnati consulted Paul Irwin. In an interview, Irwin said that he introduced Barnati to Richard Gordon. Gordon's company designed the SPCA website, and James Winston, a longtime business associate of Gordon, is listed on tax documents as the organization's executive director. SPCA International declined to make Winston available for an interview. It's not clear how much Gordon profits from his work on SPCA International, but the chief executives of PetSupplies.com, an e-commerce partner listed on the SPCA.com site, and Pet Together's, an advertiser on the site, both say their company's financial relationship is not with SPCA International, but with a separate entity, the SPCA Foundation. Now, Gordon has had a questionable past, to put it mildly. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Gordon made a lot of his money supplying the internet with X-rated adult content in the 90s. And once he made his money there, he decided to design websites for, of all things, the American Bible Society, a Christian charity. Does this mean he's an immoral guy and he'll take money no matter the cause? No, it means he designs websites, whether it be X-rated to charities, that's his prerogative. Yet the way Gordon has denied and attempted to hide it certainly raised some eyebrows with the New York Times and their article says, more than a dozen current and former employees and business partners of Gordon say that whatever operations his business now encompasses, processing transactions for pornography websites has long been a central component. Some of them requested anonymity, worried that Gordon might sue them for speaking publicly about his operations. His biggest client was said to be DTI, an amalgam of dozens of sites that offers paying customers everything from live video sessions with pornographic performers to sexually explicit manga cartoons. According to the New York Times, Gordon was one of the first people that processed credit card transactions on the internet. In 1999, to take advantage of the dot-com rush, he combined a lot of his companies into one entity, creditcards.com. However, Gordon ended up being removed when he borrowed millions from his partners using his stock as collateral and couldn't pay them back. And of course, Paul Irwin, who introduced the two, isn't much better. He was the head of the American Bible Society and from 1976 to 2004, worked for the Humane Society. He'd eventually become their chief executive, though not without leaving some scandals behind in his wake. USA Today reported in 1987 that the society spent $85,000 renovating Irwin's vacation cabin in Maine. A decade later, a judge ordered the organization to pay 1 million to the Humane Society of Canada for soliciting donations in Canada and then transferring funds to the United States. It was towards the end of his tenure in April, 2003 that Irwin first hired Gordon. Tax returns for the Humane Society show that the organization paid $881,000 to Gordon's new venture, Exciting New Technologies. Irwin even paid Gordon more than $5 million to design the American Bible Society website, a questionable number to say the least. Paul Irwin even earned himself a place on Humane Watch because of these acts. They say that he had an extremely lavish lifestyle at donors' expense while the Humane Society and hiring Gordon for millions while head of the American Bible Society led to his suspension. Needless to say, the ABS wasn't thrilled about how he mismanaged their money, let alone that he was paying someone with such massive ties to online pornography. I do believe that online porn was probably viewed in a far more scandalous light in 2008 when the article was published, but I wanna make it clear that I'm not saying he's a horrible person for having ties to the porn industry. Personally, I just find it misleading how he would just try and cover up these ties, especially from you know those who would, for obvious reasons, be opposed to working with him because of it. That's just my opinion though, feel free to take it or leave it. These three stooges, Irwin, Barnati, and Gordon, and their shady past didn't bode well for the SPCAI, especially not with Barnati at the helm. Now that we've got a pretty clear picture of how the SPCAI was founded and the people behind the charity, let's get into what they do. 
Gordon is said to not have an operational role in the shelter and in 2008, they were doing this shelter of the week program. They selected a shelter and then after fundraising for them, donated some of the money. Yet when the article was written, four out of five recent shelters to be awarded the distinction said they quote, received a thousand dollar check and a plaque for the honor, but not a percentage of any donations, end quote. The fifth only received a measly $48. Instead of giving money to the pet shelters they promote, most of their money ends up in the pockets of Quadriga Art, the subsidiary of the marketing agency, Quadriga. They unsurprisingly have their own sordid past. A charity that has been claiming to help disabled veterans is under fire. A three-year investigation into Quadriga by CNN and their profiteering off donations led to a $25 million settlement back in 2014. CNN stated, the total settlement prevents Quadriga from engaging in what it calls a funded model of beginning new charities, paying all of the startup costs and fundraising costs in advance in hopes of profit down the road. In particular, the settlement zeroes in on Quadriga's relationship with a charity based in Washington called the Disabled Veterans National Foundation, founded in 2007. The Senate investigation is ongoing, according to a spokesman from the committee. The New York State investigation found that for all intents and purposes, the charity was a front for Quadriga. From the very beginning, the state said, the investigation found DVNF lacked independence from its principal fundraiser, Quadriga. Quadriga's lawyer got the charity up and running and drafted the funding council agreement that DVNF signed. In all, the charity raised 116 million since 2008, but returned 104 million of it to Quadriga, according to the attorney general. Needless to say, the fact that the SPCAI partnered with them, well, it kind of shows you where their priorities lie and it's not actually with helping animals. Quadriga could probably be an entirely separate episode in all honesty. If they only made one or two mistakes here or there, I might be singing a different tune. Yet Mark Schulhoff and his uncle Thomas, who ran Quadriga, continued working on honing in sensitive subjects like veterans and animals. They rocket charities to prominence while driving it into debt, just as what they did with the Montreal SPCA. All in all, this doesn't exactly mean that money is being raised for shelters and animals, but the marketing company and people at the tippy top of these so-called charities. And that is until they crash and burn and then they just move on to the next project, I suppose. Hell, if you need any evidence whatsoever to know just how awful this whole marketing company shenanigan is, look no further than the Kids Wish Network. I did an episode on them about a year ago, I think, and they're still one of the most disgusting charities to date that I've had the displeasure of researching. And these guys have been assigned with them too. So even after all the scandals in 2014, they never went away. Later that year, they relaunched a company offering similar services under a new name, Innovare, and several pre-existing clients, including SPCAI, DVNF, and Kids Wish signed new contracts with them. Mark Schulhoff was not part of the management team that runs Innovare day to day. An Innovare spokesperson told the Chronicle of Philanthropy in December, 2014, but he remained chief executive of the holding company that includes Innovare and its affiliates. With all this money going towards the Schulhoffs, you probably are wondering just how much goes towards the shelters. And you'd be right to wonder. So what is the answer? Unfortunately, it's virtually nothing. Apparently it costs them about $81 to raise $100. So the vast majority of whatever you're going to give them just goes into the fundraising pockets. Of the $14 million SPCAI raised in 2010, they spent less than 0.5% or $60,000 in small cash grants to animal shelters. About 3%, just under half a million dollars, went to their Baghdad Pups program. That same year in 2010, SPCAI actually owed $8.4 million to Quadriga Art and its affiliate, Brick Mill Marketing Services, according to the public IRS records. Just like we said, Quadriga rockets charities to prominence for a massive, massive price. But speaking of OBP, let's talk about how Operation Baghdad Pups was founded because they've got quite a shady history too. Operation Baghdad Pups is run by none other than Terry Crisp, a known charity scammer. She was the founder of Noah's Wish, an animal rescue charity that settled an investigation in 2007 in the state of California. They had to pay $4 million because back in 2005, Noah's Wish received millions after Hurricane Katrina. They promised to use the money to help animals affected by the disaster, but according to CNN, A former bookkeeper who wants to conceal her identity for reasons unrelated to her work at Noah's Wish told CNN that donators came pouring into Noah's Wish soon after Hurricane Katrina. 
Crisp had appealed for donations on numerous television networks, including CNN. There was cash, there were checks, there were cashier's checks, there were letters, heartbreaking letters from kids who instead of having birthday parties, they wanted all the money to go to Noah's Wish to help those poor little animals, the woman said. On a given day, we would have, oh my gosh, easily $20,000 just in checks. And she said suddenly Terry Crisp changed, hiring her daughter and acting as if the money was hers to keep. Both made six figure salaries, the former bookkeeper said. Terry at one point said, I've worked hard for so many years doing animal rescue. I am entitled to this money. And the attitude is despicable. I understand wanting to be paid for your work, but when you work at a charity, it should be because you believe in a cause and genuinely want as much money as possible to go towards that cause. Once Terry Crisp saw dollar signs, she forgot about the animals she supposedly cared for. So the fact that she's running OBP, yeah, once again, it's not a good look for SPCAI. And again, this isn't just to say that Terry hasn't done any good before. One Washington Post article called For Animals Shelter from the Storms mentions her many years in animal rescue. They even call her the Superman of animal rescue and they write that. In 1985, she raced into a burning clinic in the hills of Los Gatos, California during a wildfire to save eight rabbits. In 1989, with many other volunteers, she flew to Alaska after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. For 12 hours a day for weeks, she cleaned oil off birds using a water pick. In 1992, she followed the path of Hurricane Andrew through South Florida. Dogs, cats, horses, cows, pigs, goats, and sheep were left dead for miles. She compared the carnage of dead animals to that of a war zone. The nauseating odor was everywhere, Chris wrote in her 1996 book, Out of Harm's Way. Several times that morning, I had to wrap my bandana around my nose and mouth. That helped, but there was nothing I could do to wipe the sight of lifeless animals. They were everywhere. Year after year, disaster after disaster, Crisp would arrive in a city only to discover that the basic mechanisms of animal rescue had to be established. So in February, Crisp started Noah's Wish, a nonprofit group devoted to training volunteers how to handle animal rescue after tragedy strikes. I have been to too many of these where we have had to start from scratch, she says. It's such a shame to hear that Terry did seemingly start with fantastic intentions only to allegedly mishandle the millions that poured in after Hurricane Katrina. Terry denies having mishandled any money and says they were simply overwhelmed and even given more money than they could spend on animals. Personally, I feel that if that were the case, they would have been better off being transparent about this rather than raising her salary. Once again, this isn't the only questionable shady act that Terry has been involved in. Terry claimed to have traveled to Iraq five times to bring 14 dogs back to the US for soldiers, which yes, that sounds fantastic, until you remember the many millions that have poured in for this cause. Not to mention, they are said to have misrepresented the program on tax filings and that many just learned how much is spent on fundraising felt lied to. CNN reporter Drew Griffin took on this story and explained that while Terry Crisp would rave about how they were taking in stranded dogs. How is it that they fall through the cracks and and get stranded there? That's unthinkable to me. It is unthinkable. And that's why SPC International is making sure that these dogs don't get forgotten. Some of these animals were actually donated and taken from adoptive homes after SPCAI asked for them. I'm not saying these dogs don't deserve forever homes by any means, but saying they were stranded and lying about their state for sympathy is again, an incredibly shady move. Two dogs in particular, Ivy and Nugget, were called abandoned military contract dogs by Terry on television. And you can actually find this clip on YouTube very easily. It was on HLN with Robin Mead. In the clip, Terry and Robin, especially though through no fault of Robin's because I don't think she knew, do everything to pull on your heartstrings. They talk about how these dogs saved lives overseas, sniffing out explosives. And Terry says they know for a fact that these dogs were abandoned military contract dogs. It's as if this is a combination move. We've talked about how animals and veterans are two topics used by scammy charities. And here we see SPCAI using veteran animals with these military dogs. Yet it simply wasn't true. Terry lied to the viewers and CNN. Again, they confirmed that these dogs were donated from adoptive homes. Drew Griffin tried to speak to Terry, but she insisted all interviews be set up through the director of communications. Griffin again repeated that you've been on our air, ma'am, and that he, as well as viewers felt lied to. As Griffin explained, the millions they earned went to Quadriga and seemingly to fund the higher ups lifestyles, not military dogs. And don't get me wrong, this isn't to say that SPCAI does absolutely nothing for animals. 
simply not as much as they would have you believe. On air, they explain that these are heroic working dogs. In actuality, many of these dogs are strays that military men have bonded with. If the charity stated on air that these dogs weren't service dogs, but pets, I would have no problem with that whatsoever. At least they would be honest. On their website nowadays, they clarify this point, seemingly because of the backlash they've gotten over their previous dishonesty. And before we continue on to talk about the SPCAI during the pandemic and onward, let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor. It's October and I am feeling the spooky season vibes. I'm ready for pumpkin everything and not at all ready to meal plan or shop for it. But that's all good because I use HelloFresh and HelloFresh sends fresh pre-measured ingredients with mouth-watering recipes right to your door so you can skip the store and get right to cooking. HelloFresh is ready with seasonal favorites like pumpkin cinnamon rolls and all the sides. Plus HelloFresh is endlessly customizable. So there's something for everyone, no matter if you need family-friendly meals, low calorie or vegetarian options. They offer over 50 recipes a week in a variety of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients. So there's sure to be something for everyone's taste. And with HelloFresh, you can customize your order every single week, change your delivery day, or skip a week entirely, whatever works for your busy spooky season schedule. So if you wanna get started, make sure to go to hellofresh.com casket14 and use code casket14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. That's up to 14 free meals, including free shipping at hellofresh.com casket14 with code casket14. This episode is also sponsored by Talkspace. Now, a fair amount of you may have seen a couple weeks, or I think maybe at this point, maybe a month and a half ago, I started talking on Twitter about how I wanted to see a therapist and I was doing some online therapy and it was working out really well for me. And this was the company, Talkspace. Uh, I I didn't actually know they would be sponsoring the show and I think that's really cool, but um, I was just using them in general and it was working kind of nice. So this is kind of like a a win-win. But the point is Talkspace makes it easy to talk with a licensed therapist right from your phone or computer or whatever you want and get the guidance or help you might need. Talkspace makes your privacy and security their number one priority. Their encryption keeps all your conversations fully protected. So it doesn't really matter what you're going through. Talkspace is there for you. So join Talkspace today and start moving forward with a single message. Just visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code casket at your sign up. Again, that's $100 off at Talkspace.com when you use promo code CASKET. The pandemic sent a shockwave through the animal welfare industry. In the early days, adoption slowed and many animal shelters were forced to close. But the SPCAI, on the other hand, saw an opportunity, as the Mother Jones article puts it. COVID has been a public relations boon for the organization with its leaders quoted in the New York Times, in the Detroit News, and in a lengthy write-up by Forbes. In an uncertain landscape for animal lovers, remember when people weren't sure if their pets might spread the virus? SPCAI's leadership offered itself as a credible expert. Our global partnerships give us a unique insight into what's happening, the charity's then executive director, Meredith Ayan, told one reporter last year. Amid the PR blitz, the group capitalized on all the classic tropes of animal fundraising. Solemn dogs with large sad eyes, for instance, exploiting the enduring power of cute puppies to separate people from their dollars with pleas that urge donors to rescue hungry and abandoned pets. An SPCAI solicitation from this past May laid out the dire situation in India during a brutal surge of the pandemic. They are operating with skeleton staffing because of reduced movement and rising numbers of COVID-19 cases, the email warned. And they are quickly running out of funds. The appeal pledged that donations will be rushed to groups in India that are keeping animals safe. But anyone who spent time looking at the group's financial records would find reason to be concerned with where their money would actually end up. SPCAI boasted a $21 million annual budget, even though their organization is at best, mostly a conduit. Yes, they have the OBP operation, but aside from this, they aren't as directly involved with animal rescue nearly as much as their advertisements would have you think. Most of the money they collect doesn't land in the hands of a shelter and over 40% of everything they've gotten since 2006 has gone to the Schulhoffs. Lori Styron, executive director of Charity Watch says, there's clearly a disconnect between how SPCAI markets its services and what they're spending most of their money on. Her organization has evaluated SPCAI seven times since 2009 and each time has given it an F, the lowest rating possible. 
You can find this rating online as well. The most recent time they gave SPCAI an F was in July, 2021. So these problems are clearly not resolved in current times. This report also stated that only 17% of funds at the moment actually goes towards their programs. And if you wanna see the silver lining here, it is some improvement from the 8% that went to programs back in 2009, but this is by no means something that should even be applauded. This is absolutely fucking pathetic. Back then, they apparently needed $129 to raise $100 in cash support, ending the year in the red while Quadriga, as always, made bank. They purchased over 6 million in printing, database, and related services from Quadriga and their subsidiaries that year. No wonder Charity Watch says donors may as well just put their money directly into Quadriga's pockets because it would make little difference. Now, not every charity evaluator gives them an F though, as Charity Navigator has given SPCAI two out of five stars and a 71.99% on their overall scale. Most of this, it seems, is due to their transparency, which is about 97%, whereas their financial score is about 60. They also claim that it only costs 26 cents to raise a dollar, as opposed to $81 per $100 or 81% that Charity Watch reported. Just by looking at their 2019 paperwork, I do see where they had $21 million in expenses and only spent half a million in programs, but I won't pretend to be an expert at reading these charity tax forms. If you want to take a look at it, it will be linked in my sources, but generally speaking, I think we can say it's pretty clear that the SPCAI doesn't give as much as they imply and Quadriga is undoubtedly thrilled to have them as a client. But again, despite this, SPCAI has continued to make headlines and profit from the pandemic. Mother Jones again writes, in recent months, SPCAI has benefited from the kind of public relations push that larger charities must envy. After a wave of coronavirus related coverage last spring, Forbes profiled the Baghdad Pups program in a December story that credited the charity with returning 47 pets from Iraq during the pandemic. None of the pieces mentioned the program's scandalous past. In late July, SPCAI's fundraising emails were back in my inbox, no email signature this time, recounting the charity's work. From treating starving monkeys in Tanzania to rescuing abandoned cats in Brazil, my donation I was promised would be rushed to the cause of my choosing with no mention that SPCAI, per its latest public filings, gave more than $9 million of its revenue to Innover. No matter which one you choose, the email pledged, you'll be helping hungry, sick, hurting, and scared animals. I understand that during COVID, the willingness and need to help is strong. It's just important that no matter how much we want to help others, we continue to do research into these organizations. SPCA International is by no means the worst charity I've covered, but they've got a lot of shady activity surrounding them from their founder to obscene amounts of money they spend on marketing. I have no doubt that perhaps they do good somewhere, but I'm pretty comfortable saying that I think the money would be better spent elsewhere. And lastly, yes, there's the obvious fact that they sound incredibly similar to the ASPCA, a well-known animal charity. And yes, Terry and the SPCAI are aware of how similar they sound to the ASPCA and the whole domain name confusion didn't help. It can also make it incredibly difficult to find reputable information on SPCA International when there's so many SPCAs out there. Yet, is the ASPCA really the gold standard of animal organizations? Well, there have been some accusations of wasteful spending in the past, though none to this extent. According to Charity Navigator, about 75% of their funds go towards their programs. Yet Charity Watch once again has different statistics and claimed that they spend about 40% of their budget on overhead and that takes 38 cents to raise a dollar. This is still a far cry from what they said about the SPCAI, and while they gave that organization an F, they gave the ASPCA a C in 2019. The ASPCA has also been found to have euthanized animals, even ones that other rescue groups are willing to save. One infamous case was with a dog called Oreo that they were insistent be put down. Oreo's law was introduced in New York after this, trying to make it illegal to kill animals that rescue groups were willing to save. Other sources say that Oreo's law wouldn't have actually saved Oreo, but instead the bill should have required public shelters to work with qualified rescues or implement some contractual agreement with NYC shelters. This again is only the Cliff Notes version of the ASPCA's controversies, but it's pretty clear even from a cursory search that they are not nearly as bad as their knockoff, the SPCAI. All in all, every charity, like companies, can make mistakes. 
However, when lives of the vulnerable are at stake, it's especially important to do your research and know if those mistakes are something that you can live with. For me, it's something I don't think I could. And in any good conscience, I could not give any of my money to SPCA International. By far, they are not the worst charity we've covered, but I'd hardly consider that a compliment either. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the recent episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to my Linktree link, which will of course give you all the links to all my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. So thank you all so much for spending some of your time here with me today. I appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.